Welcome to the Great Dialogue, ang tambayan ng mga lito pero hindi magpapauto. Hello to everyone! How are you? Kumusta? Jaljine, kumusta kayo? And we are back for our second episode. Ano bang pag-uusapan natin for today? Kung sa first episode, we revisited the past and tackled Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, for today, let us talk about pandemic ethics. Nako, very relevant pala ng episode today. And we can lean on to none other than Peter Singer's Practical Ethics Discussion on Rich and Poor. Before we dive deeper into Singer's argument, our approach on the first episode was a very light conversation. In today's episode, however, there are instances that need to be taken seriously. Kaya naman, just sit back and prepare yourself for some moral dilemmas. Let's start! Our conversation for today will begin with some facts about poverty and affluence, the moral equivalence of murder, Singer's main argument, and some objections on his argument. Let's take a look at extreme poverty and absolute affluence, two contrasting scenarios of life that are normally experienced in our world today. The World Bank defines extreme poverty as when people fall below the status quo of being poor, not having sufficient income to meet the basic human needs for adequate food, water, shelter, clothing, sanitation, health care, or education. It is often characterized by malnutrition, illiteracy, disease, miserable surroundings, high infant mortality, and low life expectancy. The worst part about it is that it kills. It is responsible for the loss of countless lives, especially among infants and young children. Unlike the deaths from major calamities being reported from here and there, deaths caused by poverty are less visible, but more predictable and preventable. The situation does not make the headlines, but there were people who died from hunger yesterday, and more will probably die tomorrow. It is wrong to assume that when there are no major calamities being reported, everything is well. On the other side, absolute affluence exists. There are people who have more income than they need to provide themselves adequately with all the basic necessities of life. After taking care of their basic necessities, they still get to spend their resources on luxuries to indulge in their pleasures. As Singer pointed out, the affluent choose their food for pleasure, not to stop hunger. They buy new clothes to look good, not to keep warm. They move house to be in a better neighborhood, not to keep out the rain, and after all these, there is still money to spend on overseas holidays. By this standard, the majority of the citizens of Western Europe, North America, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and the oil-rich Middle Eastern states are all absolutely affluent. These people have wealth they can't afford to give the poor without threatening their own basic welfare. If all these people transfer the portion of their income to the poor, a lot can change in the face of poverty. At present, very little aid is being donated. There is a target set by the United Nations. 0.7% of the gross national income every rich nation earns should be donated as foreign aid. Only Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, and Sweden have reached this level. The rest are donating less than this. And what these nations are giving is only of little value compared to their income. So given these facts, Singer denotes that by giving less than they actually can, the affluent are allowing those in poor countries to suffer from extreme poverty that causes malnutrition, ill health, and death. Furthermore, he concludes that if allowing someone to die is not intrinsically different from killing someone, then it would seem that we are all murderers. Do you agree with his statement given that it is very straightforward and harsh? He is saying that living in an affluent style without contributing to a foreign aid agency is ethically equivalent to killing an innocent individual. With this, he enumerated significant differences between deliberately killing and spending money on luxuries rather than giving it away to save lives. First, they differ in motivation. Deliberately killing someone comes with an intent accompanied by malice, sadism, or other unpleasant motives. Spending money on luxuries rather than giving it away to save lives, on the other hand, indicates selfishness or indifference to the sufferings of others. Second, it's not difficult for us to not kill because there is a rule against killing people. However, to save the lives of all we can is not realistically required. 
Third, there is a greater certainty of the outcome of killing when compared with not giving aid. There is no certainty that the money you gave, or did not give, could have actually saved lives. Fourth, victims who have been killed are identifiable, whereas most of us will be able to specifically point out who is dying in extreme poverty. Fifth, killers are responsible for the death of their victims. Victims wouldn't have died if it weren't for the killer's doing. However, the affluent can say, I did not cause the plight of the hungry, so why would I be held responsible for it? Singer maintains that these differences are just extrinsic. They are normally associated with the weight of killing versus allowing someone to die. But he asserted that they are not necessary when we are comparing the two. Take the lack of an identifiable victim. Suppose you are selling something. You learn that this product can cause deadly effects to the people that consume it, yet you still continue to sell it. Your decision may have no identifiable victim. It is impossible to tell who among your consumers died because they consumed what you sold. But this impossibility does not make your decision justifiable, even if your consumers are aware of the effects. So if this is true for killing an unidentifiable individual, how does it differ from failing to save another unidentifiable person living in poverty? Next, the lack of certainty that by giving money we could save a life reduces the wrongness of not giving compared with deliberately killing. However, it is enough to justify that not giving when you know you should is an unacceptable conduct. Then, we are also aware that we have an obligation to help those whose misfortunes we have caused. This point may be approached in two views, the consequentialist view and the non-consequentialist view. For the consequentialist view, it tells that we are responsible for all the consequences of our action. Example, you are responsible for the death of a poor individual for spending your money on an iPad because you could have just sacrificed your money to buy the poor some food. For the non-consequentialist view, it is more grounded on the theory of rights. And it says that, if everyone has the right to life, and this right is a right against others who might threaten my life, but not a right to assistance from others when my life is in danger, then we can understand that we are responsible for killing, but not when we fail to save. So, the non-consequentialist view is basically like saying, as long as we leave each other alone, and we don't do anything that might harm others, we do not violate their rights. Singer does not conform to this view. Our current economic order tells us that we contribute to the impoverishment of some people to our own benefit. Take, for example, the exploitation of resources among poor countries. We rely on resources like oil and minerals brought from countries ruled by dictators, who use this money to make themselves richer and more powerful. The dictators are robbers, and we are receivers of stolen goods. We are not the ones directly exploiting the poor but we are certainly contributing to their poverty. Failing to save a life is not always ethically equivalent to deliberately killing. However, this does not show that the act of not giving when you are capable is less serious. It is clear that we have this sense of moral responsibility toward how we respond to the situations of absolute poverty and absolute affluence. For the next part, we'll discuss our moral obligation to assist and how it applies to the present situation. In the discussion of the obligation to assist, here is Singer's argument. Pause the video to better understand the scenario. With this, he presents his principle that would support the judgment of pulling the child out. That is, if it is in our power to prevent something very bad from happening, without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral significance, we ought to do it. Singer's principle is very straightforward. This explains why we should save the drowning child because his or her life is far important than your outfit. However, Singer mentions that the principle can be deceptive, that if taken seriously, our world, as Singer puts it, can be fundamentally changed. Let us view it in this way. In reality, there are a lot of bad situations. There are nuances and there are a lot of things that we could do, but it is not equal for everyone. Weighing the good things you do in order to arrive at the good situation is having choices to be able to do something good. And those choices or sacrifices are relative. What's a heavy sacrifice for someone might be an easy one for another. Following the principle is a black and white situation. 
just do good if it wouldn't hurt you so much. But situations are very different. In this world, you cannot really compare immediate death to alleviating poverty for some people because it also has a temporal aspect. We can aid people who we see right there and then, but to try to aid someone to be rich, it is more of a process. With this, Singer maintains that the application of this principle is not only limited to saving a drowning child from a pond, but also the daily situations such as assisting those living in absolute poverty. To understand better, the first premise is the moral premise on which the argument rests. Both the consequentialist and non-consequentialist should accept the principle. Obviously, this favors the consequentialist that you weigh options. The non-consequentialist must accept it too, because to prevent something bad applies only when nothing comparably significant is at stake. The principle cannot lead to serious violations or other evil acts. Non-consequentialist holds that we directly do what is good. With the second premise, it is difficult to find a plausible ethical view that does not regard extreme poverty as a bad thing. There are problems in the world that we find difficult not to see extreme poverty as a cause on why they happen. The third premise is crucial because it claims that some extreme poverty can be prevented without the sacrifice of anything of comparable moral significance. Walang kwenta lang yung donation ko, or sobrang minimal lang ng matutulong niyan. However, it is not about the amount of change you can give to poverty as a whole, but you, making your contribution, will prevent poverty, so act on it. And to think, kapag nagsama-sama yung drops in the ocean donations na yan, sa kabuuan, nagiging malaki siya. No matter how small, it can help alleviate poverty collectively. Affluence means that we can cut off some of our income without having to sacrifice basic needs, and we can use this income to reduce extreme poverty. Therefore, we can conclude that we ought to prevent some extreme poverty, for it does not entail solving the entirety of extreme poverty. Then Singer moves on to the objections to the argument. First, the effectiveness of donations. Some will argue that once the nation could be stolen, only a small fraction will be given to the people, will fail to save lives, and will not help people out of extreme poverty. Singer argues that aid organizations use no more than 20% of the funds they raise for administrative purposes. These administrative costs include salary costs of experienced professionals that can make sure that a sustainable and a long-term approach to helping will be established. Also, these organizations work directly on the ground and have a proven track record. Going back to the shallow pond scenario, wading into the pond knowing you only have a 75-80% to 80% chance to save the small child, wouldn't you still try to save the child? Danger. Singer adds that it is difficult to justify that distance does not make a crucial difference to our obligations. Singer presents an example of racial affinities. Should people of European origin help poor Europeans before helping poor Africans? His discussion on the principle of equal consideration explains that race should not be a basis for us to help, and if Africans had greater need, choosing to help Europeans would be a violation to this principle. Similarly, citizenship and nationhood work this way. It would take a lot of money to help improve the lives of people whose income is less than $22,000, which is considered poor in the United States, but in developing countries, it would cost you less than $1,000 to save a child. To go back, obligations of kinship are stronger than those of citizenship, but we may be put in situations where our lives are better and our obligation to kinship is quite fulfilled. Thus, it is right that we aid the needs of those distant from us. But to explain why we choose our kin lies in the advantage of a recognized system of responsibilities, us having priorities. And to say that we are equally responsible for everyone in the world may be out of line. The argument for an obligation to assist does not hold this view for allowing one's kin to sink into poverty is sacrificing something of comparable significance. In sum, knowing you can help, then help, even if there may be other people present that could help but don't. You might ask, why should I carry this burden? Singer believes what is fair wouldn't matter anymore in this case. What matters is whether you choose to act or not. Third would be property rights. 
Do people have a right to private property? Some theories would suggest if the acquisition of their property is good, hindi by force or fraud, then they deserve such wealth while others starve. In contrast, Singer presents values reflected in Christian doctrines where property is viewed as satisfaction. Same goes for the socialists that wealth is for the society rather than the individual. And as a utilitarian, it would be practical to prevent evil acts when it comes to property. The property of rights does not necessarily contradict the argument for an obligation to assist. It only explains how one could have property without obligating the rich to give to the poor. Robert Nozick thinks this way. He contends that one can help through voluntary means, say, charity. But for him, it is not an obligation for rich people to give to the poor. At the same time, he acknowledges that the poor should be aided. In a way, Nozick discerns the inequality but does not give the burden to the rich people. However, it is in this thought that Singer thinks we should not accept an individualist theory of property rights. Sa argument ng obligation to assist, dapat pantay-pantay, walang mas mayroon kaysa sa iba. Kasi parang if may nakakaangat, mayroong ring mas nasa baba. Very equity yung approach. Ayaw ni Singer yung concept na may nakakalamang. Da- dahil pag may ganito, kung sino ang nakakaangat, sila ang may capacity na tumulong sa mga nasa baba. With this with his given scenario on habitation, it can be said that he rhetorically asks, if one is born poor or rich, should he maintain such lifestyle? If you were born to billionaire parents, does that help? Impartial talaga, kasi parang swartihan lang. Pero what after? While knowing that people experience poverty, should one live life luxuriously? So ang kasunod naman is population and ethics of triage. Ngayon dito, sinasabi na overpopulation daw ang main cause of poverty and dahil dito, pag daw tumulong tayo sa mga mahihirap ngayon, magra-result lang to sa mas mahira- maraming mahihirap in the future. Dahil sa argument na to, we should adapt daw a policy of triage. Sa konting background muna sa triage na to, nanggaling tong term na to nung panahon pa ng mga gera and dahil nga sa kakulangan ng doktor para magbigay ng medical assistance sa mga sugatan, yung mga wounded daw ay nakakategorize into three. Una, yung mga sugatan pero hindi kailangan ng medical assistance. Pangalawa, yung mga sugatan na kaya pang mag-survive if nabigyan ng medical assistance. Pangatlo, yung mga hindi na magsusurvive pa kahit bigyan ng medical assistance. Sa tatlong kategory na to, yung pangalawa, yung mabibigyan ng medical assistance kasi nga sila pa yung may chance mag-survive and to limit na rin yung medical resources dahil st- scarce nga ito. Noong 1970s, may mga tao na nag-suggest na i-apply itong same policy na to sa mga countries para maging self-sustaining sila. Ibig sabihin, hindi natutulungan yung mga bansa na kaya namang tumayo sa sarili nilang mga paa. Also, hindi na rin tutulungan pa yung mga bansa na kahit matulungan pa eh, hindi na, hindi na nila kaya pa maging self-sustaining country. Ang tutulungan na lang is yung mga may mataas na chance na makasurvive by balancing their population and food. Basically, sila yung nasa second category dun sa triage. Sa argument na to, si Garrett Hardin, an American ecologist, he presented a metaphor in support of this view. Sinasabi niya na para tayong nasa lifeboat, and yung mga mayayaman na nations ay yung nasa boat, tapos yung mga nasa dagat na nalulunod, sila yung mga mahihirap. Pag sinubukan daw nating isave yung mga nalulunod and dalhin sa lifeboat, masadamay daw yung mga nasa lifeboat and lahat is malulunod. Kumbaga, it's better for the few to survive than everyone drowning. According to Garrett, itong lifeboat ethics na to, nag to sa today's world. The rich should leave the poor countries kasi they will be dragged down along with the poor countries. Nasight ni Garrett yung mga countries such as India and Bangladesh as examples na kung saan yung population growth is so rapid to the point na hindi na kinakaya ng carrying capacity nito. Sinadjust ni Garrett na hayaan na lang yung mga natural causes such as famine, disasters, and diseases na i-reduce yung population nila to the level na kaya na nilang masupport yung salili nila. However, maraming nag-disagree sa view ni Garrett na to saying na overpopulation is a myth daw kasi ang mundo daw natin is nagpo-produce ng enough food para ma-feed nito yung population. Sinasabi nila na ang totoong sanhi kung bakit nagugutom yung mga tao 
is because of unequal land distribution and because of international and economic exploits na kung saan naagrabyado yung mga mahihirap ng mayayaman para sa sarili nilang kapakanan. Furthermore, sinusupport nila tong argument na to by saying that sobrang daming grains and soybeans ang nasasayang daw dahil pinapakain sila sa mga animals na nagpo-provide ng konting nutritional value compared sa mga plant foods. Nasasayang din daw yung mga grains dahil nagagamit daw sila para maging biofuel wherein mayayaman lang daw ng nakikinabang. It is worth noting na by the time sinulat ni Garrett yung life both ethics, yung populations ng India and Bangladesh daw ay unti-unti nang bumababa to the point na slowly na nilang nakuklose yung gap ng mga nagugutom na tao, which proves Garrett wrong by not giving them aid. However, hindi lang India and Bangladesh ang mga concerned dahil sobrang dami pang bansa na nagkakaroon ng overpopulation such as Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Democratic Republic of Congo wherein in expect na by 2050 to double na yung population nila. So in view of this, the question still stands na how should we respond to these rapid rates ng population growth sa mga bansang may matataas na population and also lives in extreme poverty? Well, yung mga advocates ng triage, sinasabi nila na hayaan na lang nga yung mga natural disasters na mag-handle sa mga to. However, ways like this are mostly frowned upon pero sinasabi nila na initial reactions daw based on strong feelings are not always reliable guides. Naniniwala rin ang mga triage advocates sa long-term consequences. This means that kung tutulong tayo sa mga may hirap ngayon, by the time na hindi na tayo able makapagbigay ng tulong, yung poverty and suffering would be greater imbes na tinigil na natin noon pa lang. Kung ire-reject naman daw yung triage, magpi-play into account yung probability sa consequentialist ethics. Dito, sinasabi na yung action na magpo-produce ng konting benefit is preferred over sa action na mas malaki yung benefit pero equally likely to fail. Sinasabi rin na we should only choose the greater benefit kahit na uncertain kapag na-outweigh niya isang option. So to put into perspective, yung one certain unit of benefit is better than five units of benefit pero 10% chance lang na mangyayari. However, 3 units of benefit daw is better than one certain unit of benefit kapag yung 3 units na yun is 50% of happening. Kung baga, mas mataas compared sa 10%. So dito, sinasabi na kapag nireject natin yung triage, ano yung probability na kapag tumulong tayo, eh mas pangit yung, pala- mas pangit yung kalalabasan. Sinasabi rin pala na same principle applies when we're trying to avoid evils. People argued na dahil nga sa pagtulong, magre-resulta to sa mas maraming may hirap in the future. Kaya mas magandang huwag ng tumulong and hayaan na yung natural calamities ang maghandle sa overpopulation. Kaya lang, sabi ni Singer, the question still stands na gano ka probable yung prediction na kapag tumulong tayo will lead to greater disasters in the future. Sabi niya pa na predicting population is flawed and yung mga factors na nag affect sa population is pure speculations lamang. Ang most widely accepted model daw, sinasabi na yung mga bansa dumadaan sa tinatawag na demographic transition. So dahil transition, may stages, and nagsisimula yung mga bansa na sobrang hirap, so wala silang access sa modern medicine. Dahil dito, mataas yung fertility rate, pero mataas din yung death rate, lalo na sa infant mortality. Yung sunod nun is kapag na-introduce na and naging accessible na yung modern medicine and techniques, nililesen na yung child mortality and this will lead to population growth. After that, habang bumababa na yung child mortality, nare-realize na ng mga tao na para mag-survive yung mga anak nila hanggang maturity age, hindi sila dapat mag-anak ng sobrang dami. So, yung kumbaga yung kaya lang nilang suportahan. Then, dahil nga nagkakaroon na ng konting na sa mga tao, papasok na rin dito yung improved education, emancipation, and employment of women. Dahil dito, sa mga to, bababa na yung birth rate and as a result, yung population growth begins to level off. Halos na mga mayayaman na bansa ay napagdaanan na tong mga stages na to, kaya naman yung population growth nila is hindi mataas, which is a good thing. According kay Singer, if this model is right, then hindi na natin kailangan pa mag-resort into inhumane ways such as famine, disasters, etc. para makontrol ang overpopulation. Matutulungan natin yung mga may hirap na bansa para ma yung living standards nila. May encourage yung mga government na magbigay ng equal land reforms for everyone. Mas magandang education and awareness. Contraception and sterilization will also be introduced para mas makontrol ang population growth. Yung mga measures na mentioned, uh, they have a fair chance para mas mapabilis yung mga may hirap na bansa na dumaan sa kanya-kanya nilang demographic transition. So, paano naman kapag yung bansa is naghihirap and overpopulated, 
pero they restrict the use of contraception dahil sa religious or nationalistic reason. Sabi ni Singer, pwedeng magbukang ini-impose natin yung ideas natin sa kanila, pero itong act na to is not unjustifiable naman. We have an obligation to assist, pero we have to keep in mind na hindi tayo obligado to make sacrifices of equal comparable significance. Ibig sabihin, hindi tayo obligadong tulungan yung mga bansa na ina-undermine ng gobyerno yung tulong na binibigay natin sa kanila. This may seem harsh sa mga citizen dahil nga wala naman silang say sa mga ginagawa ng gobyerno nila. Pero kailangan na lang isipin na mas makakatulong tayo sa maraming tao if itutuon na lang natin yung binibigay nating aid sa kanila sa mga iba pang mas nangangailangan kasi nga nasasayang. So para sa next na ano, argument is leaving it to the government. Dito, ina-argue ng mga tao na hindi tayo obligado tumulong kasi marami rin namang tao na hindi tumutulong. Pero kapag iisipin natin yung drowning toddler case, imagine na maraming tao yung nasa shore na, naka, na nakikita yung bata na nalulunod. Obviously, hindi naman sila tatayo lang doon and papanoorin mamatay yung bata kahit yung iba is hindi a-action. Sinasabi rin ng mga tao na ang dulot talaga ng kahirapan is dahil sa gobyerno. While others say naman na dahil sa mga underlying structural problems and dapat yun yung pagtuunan natin ng pansin. Pero kung iisipin ulit yung drowning toddler case, imagine na kaya nalulunod yung mga bata sa pond is dahil may playground na katabi and dahil sa paglalaro dito, nalalaglag sila sa pond. Of course, sasabihin natin na i-move yung playground, kumaga mag-advocate tayo na i-move yung playground, pero unayin nating tulungan is yung mga nalulunod. Oo, isasolve natin yung mga underlying structural problems, pero dapat rin nating matulungan ASAP yung mga nalulunod. So, ang kasunod na objection to the argument na too high a standard. Sinasabi ng mga tao na yung argument ni Singer ay masyadong demanding daw na tipong dapat mamuhay lang tayo ng simple and huwag gumasa sa mga luho. Ang counter argument naman ni Singer dito is how radical it may sound, kailangan pa rin natin itong gawin kasi morality is sometimes challenging. Sabi naman ng mga tao na we should make a less radical commitment. Kung baga mas toned down version such as donating 10% lang ng income kasi yung ganitong amount daw hindi naman maapektuhan masyado yung average donor and may mga researchers na nagbabak up dito. Sabi naman ni Singer, yung mga ganitong tulong, tulong pa rin sila kahit na they are done in smaller commitments. Lalo na yung ibang tao e eh, nahanap nila yung joy and satisfaction sa pagbibigay ng tulong. So that's all for the objection of the argument. Guys, nandiyan pa ba kayo? Eto, sumabak na naman ng konti kong brain cells to process things. Pero aminin, nakakataba ng utak ang ganitong conversation. As we bid goodbye for today's episode, we talked about extreme poverty and absolute affluence. We also delved into the moral equivalence of murder, presenting differences to weight of killing and allowing someone to die. Lastly, we discussed Singer's argument on obligation to assist and the objections to it. Ay, ano nga ba magdidikta sa anong tamang dapat gawin kung tayo maraming pagkakaiba? Iwanan na natin yan sa ating mga sarili. I guess that's it for today. Here on Tamayan ng Mga Lito, pero hindi magpapautok. The Great Dialogue.